Welcome back. Today we're going to go over Romans chapter 5. So for a simplified overview, the first section ought to fill the believer with hope as it promises peace for those who have faith. And there is no condemnation for those who believe in Jesus Christ. Romans 8. Then the ungodly get brought up again, a rehash of Romans 4. They are the ones who receive the free gift of salvation, not the self-righteous workers of the law. The reward for those who have faith is escape from wrath, whereas tribulation and wrath fall for those who follow the law. That's the rapture. Next is Adam as the model and the process of reconciliation back to God. The word is reconciliation, not atonement. Finally, a simple summary of the law's purpose to increase man's transgression and grace having more power than the law. That's the simple overview. The detailed overview, verse by verse, verses 1 through 5, is justification by faith and peace with God, receiving the promise of hope. Verses 6 through 8 are the ungodly sinners who are receiving salvation. 9 and 10, the separation of the two groups, wrath and rapture. Verse 11, reconciliation, not atonement, and the model being Adam. Verses 12 4 through 14, the genetic sin of Adam that we inherit, needing this reconciliation back to God. Verse 15, the free gift. Verses 16 through 19, how Adam is reconciled unto Jesus in the process of God becoming all in all at the end. Verse 20, the purpose of the law, that offenses may abound. And verse 21, sin verse grace. Okay, that's it. Now let's get started. Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Very simple. Chapter 5 begins with a conclusion for the premise of chapter 4. The ungodly are justified by faith in the model of Abraham. Genesis 15, 6. Quote, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Unquote is because of our faith in Christ that we have peace with God. Nothing else is included. No believer can be condemned by their fleshly sin. We have peace with God. Romans 4, verses 2 through 5, quote, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Paul is literally quoting Genesis 15, 6. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but out of debt, labors, wage workers, hirelings. But him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Mm. The hope of the glory of God. By whom, by Jesus, we have access to God's grace, not human effort of sinning less or law-keeping or repenting of your sin. Hope of the glory of God is future. Yet, Jesus was glorified at his resurrection and is glorified again in his saints at his coming. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, quote, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired, admired in all them that believe in that day, because our testimony among you was believed. What testimony is that? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hope. Hope is the top rung. It's the fourth and last step of the revelation of faith. Tribulations of the flesh, the carnality, self-righteousness and pride, swinging, this is all spectrum, to self-pity and condemnation. Some are walking around holier than thou art, right? With their pride, thinking they're upholding the law. 
thinking they're better, thinking they're serving God, and the other ones who know that they're full of sin, know that they're wretched, they see it, yet they won't die to the law because they think they need to uphold the law, and that leads them to self-pity and condemnation. God wants neither one of these for anyone. The so-called diverse, these tribulations that Paul references in verse 3, knowing that tribulations worketh patience and experience and then hope, James and Peter use the exact same phraseology other than calling it not tribulation, but diverse temptation and manifold temptation. The tribulation is temptation, and that temptation is exactly what it sounds like, temptation to sin. James 1, 2, and 3, experience and hope. James has the exact same model as Paul in this epistle of Romans. They say the exact same thing. This part of Romans 5 is in James 1. The Holy Spirit is simply in the believer. Statement of fact. Sealed and cannot be removed. That was Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. The promised possession sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of the per redemption of that purchased possession. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's a repeat of Romans 4, 4 and 5. Christ died for the ungodly. It is the ungodly who are justified by faith. If we had strength to be obedient to the law and never break it, then we wouldn't need Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Yet people are trying to uphold the law, thinking that it adds to their righteousness. We are weak in the flesh and in the law, ungodly. The chaff is for the fire, as the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. God justified the ungodly man, here and in Romans 4, 5. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. He's making a contrast. Right? Uh, people go to war for their nation and they die for their nation. But to die for an individual man, very rare for a good man or a righteous man. Will someone die? But no, Christ died for evil men, for bad men, for ungodly men. That's his point. That is who God is. He loves unconditionally. God himself died for you, even knowing many wouldn't accept his death in their place as a substitutionary offering. But God commandeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The law had not made anyone righteous. All were sinners. We had the opportunity, which was always just to increase our trespass, as this chapter will say. All are still sinners, when Christ died for us. The flesh still sins, and it won't stop sinning. You can't get rid of that sin. Sin is confined to the realm of the flesh until the glorification at his coming for those whom believe. Then we have to wait for the mortals in the millennium to be judged by either the book of life or the books of works. That's Revelation 20, verse 12. Yet, while we continue to sin in the flesh according to the law, we are not under the law. That was the conclusion and the statement of Romans chapter 3, where he begins to tell the doctrine in verses 19 through 21. And sin is not imputed to us, as Romans 4.15 says, and we're going to see here in a moment in verse 13 of this chapter. Sin is not imputed to us. This is why Paul says, while we were yet sinners, past tense, implying we are no longer sinner, sinners, according to justification, because sin is not imputed to us. It's not charged to our account, just like we went over in chapter 4. It's like you commit these crimes, but you are not charged with the crime. You don't go before the go to trial before the judge and the jury. You never even charged with it. You didn't even get a ticket for it. In that way, we no longer are accountable to that sin, and sin doesn't exist any longer because of that. While we were yet sinners, this past tense, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. More then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For 
Okay. Well, it is this. This is a so the sa metha. Future passive. We shall be. Future passive. So tha sa metha. Okay. Earlier in chapter four, I went after the shall be, that we shall have, or it shall be imputed to us. No, it is imputed to us. That was present tense. This one is future passive and it's plural. So it includes everybody. Now being justified by his blood, we shall be, is correct, saved from wrath through him. Dia. From wrath, the 70th week of Daniel, tribulation and great tribulation. Romans is written past the dispensation of the Jews. The Jews are falling away in Israel. Paul is speaking to the body of Christ through dia in Greek on account of him because we are in him and he in us by the Holy Spirit. That's how we are saved through him. We're literally physically in him. This was not a condition to the kingdom of heaven. That is Israel specifically during the millennial reign to have the Holy Spirit. It is a promise to the kingdom of God. So if you want to know a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, here's Romans 14, 17. The full thing will be broken down to the kingdom of God is the Holy Ghost. The full passage is the kingdom of God is not a matter of meat nor drink, but of peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Take out the extra text and you have a definition for what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is the Holy Ghost. Who are the recipients of the Holy Ghost? The body of Christ. The Holy Spirit was never promised to Israel. Some were filled with the Spirit, but by and large, it's not an overwhelming promise to the inhabitants of the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of God, us. If, when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Okay, so we have that so the sa metha, again, future passive. Okay, we shall be saved by his life. So earlier, once again, talking about it shall be imputed to us in Romans 4. No, it is imputed to us. So is this future salvation? No. It's being saved from the wrath. We have wrath of tribulation and we have saved by his life, the rapture. We already extern we are already eternally secure by our justification by belief that opens this chapter. Paul is still speaking about the great tribulation, saved from his from wrath through him in verse 9. We shall be so tha so metha future passive unlike the ah there it is romans 4 24 right saved is in regards to from the wrath through him not salvationary salvation this is the gathering in the air and the rapture from first thessalonians 4 17. okay let's keep going and not only so but we also joy in god through our lord jesus christ by whom we have now received the atonement. Where Ooh, the atonement. Yeah. So, chapter 4, I presented that atonement, which is a covering of the sins, is not the same as the forgiveness of the cross. Here, though, I look like a giant idiot, right? Because it literally says, by whom we have now received the atonement. Okay, atonement. This is Greek in the Strong's 24, or 2643. What is that? Katal alye. All right, reconciliation, the root, katal, uh, katal lasso, okay, reconcile. The word is reconciliation based on its root of reconcile, the restoration of the favor of God to sinners. This is going to make far more sense to call it reconciliation when it brings up Adam rather than the atonement. Reconciliation is the root of the word. That's the way it should have been translated here. Uh... So let's read the definition for this again. This is Strong's definition. The restoration of the favor of God to sinners, the ungodly that Paul was just speaking about, that repent, and repentance is to change one's mind, the official definition of repent. You change your mind about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not the Savior, becomes Jesus Christ is the Savior. That is true repentance. And put their trust in the exposit, exp, uh, I can't say the word, death of Christ. 
not the same as the Feast of Atonement and the covering of sin. Our sins are fully forgiven, and we are not imputed for our sins. Thus, we are no longer called sinners. Sinners are past. They are behind us. And we are favored. We are favored by belief apart from works, even while we are still yet ungodly. Romans 4.4. 4. Now we're going to get into the model of reconciliation. Adam, who is our model for salvation? Abraham. So we have two different models being brought up here. Adam is the model for our reconciliation, or he's the premise, the reason why we need to be reconciled. Paul's going to talk in not only here, but another epistle, I think it's I don't remember. It's another epistle, and he talks about the first and last Adam. It might be in my notes here. We'll see. For, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Okay. So, one man, Adam, right? Sin singular, by the way. And this comes up. This is for a future study. Not in this one, but singular sin, singular transgression compared to plural sin. Who is being spoken of there? That will be an interesting video related to the world of the angels before the world of man. For until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Let me pause and actually read that first note. Sin is a disease that all in humans inherit from Adam. It is incurable in the flesh. We live with it unto death or when we are transfigured at the rapture and resurrection. Now, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. I've been nailing this point home, and here's a big verse for it. Where there is no sin, or excuse me, where there is no law, there is no transgression, was the other verse in Romans 4. Here we have sin is not imputed when there is no sin. This is why all, all people still died who were not Jewish, nor knew the law. Just because law increases trespass, everybody still died. And Paul's getting into why in this part of the chapter. Romans 1.20 speaks of the law of creation and men without excuse to see the creations of God. We're held to account. Even if we don't have the Jewish law, the law of Moses, we are held to account by what we do. Right? This is specifically speaking about the world in general. The believer is not judged by what he does or does not do, but by his faith. Moreover, once one sees their condemnation in the law and their death because of the law, then there is only life in Christ. He's the only option. We choose him because we know that there is no other way. There are They are dead by the law. Thus, sin is not imputed when there is no law. Through their sin, though their sin still exists, it is not charged to their account because the there is no law to uphold it, right? Imagine a country that removed every law off of its books. It would be chaos, right? That's the way that people say, uh, let us do evil that grace may abound. Or the gospel is not a, um, a license to sin, is what they say today. That's the way that they're picturing it. Um, you remove murder from off the books of the national law, therefore everyone's going to go out and murder. In the world, that might be true, but with Christ dwelling in you, it's not, okay? Paul and those who preach the gospel have to deal with the side effects of this re reality, and we will too when we get there. I just told you what it was. Notice the Greek on, being, is translated as when there is no law, not where there is no law in this statement. It is a matter of there being no law. Not a matter of location. That would be where, as it was in the previous passage that was very similar to this. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now we have when. So what's the difference of those two statements? The law of Moses was first for national Israel as their covenant with God at Mount Sinai. But now it applies to all men to show that their trespass against God's law and need for Christ. Those who say the law is only for national Israel are ignorant, though they often be on the side of free grace in saying so, right? It's an argument that gracers use, that the law just applies to Israel. No, that's the point of this statement, when there is no law. Once again, it reflects back to the previous chapter, when 
when Paul is talking about Abraham, and in Galatians, he makes the point that Abraham's circumcision was 430 years before the law, when there was no law. That's the point of the, him saying when there is no law, not just where there is no law. It's not just a matter of those outside of Israel are not held to account of the law, but the timing of it. Because the law was until Christ, as he's going to get in here in, in a moment. So I hope you see the difference between the when and where there is no law. Because we're in a time when there is no law for those that are in Christ. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Why does he say death reigns from Adam just until Moses? Death reigns from Adam until now, right? Because there was no law before Moses. Law increases our transgression. His point, when there was no law, sin is not imputed. So did all that live after Adam unto Moses not sin? Of course they did. But there was no law to account it before the judge. Hence the example of the United States, all of a sudden all laws were just gone right? What would happen? None of those sins are transgressed because they're not held account to anybody, but people still would commit crimes. Make sense? They are children of man who fell. Everybody. Verse 16. For the judgment, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. Anyway, let's keep going. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. All are dead as the children of Adam, everyone. Every soul ever born of water of the womb are dead in spirit, except John the baptizer. This is a side note. Filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. See Romans 6, 4. We did nothing to earn the dead spirit that needs the quickening of the Holy Spirit. We were just born that way. We didn't agree to inherit the sin, but we need the Holy Spirit to be brought to life. This problem is held upon the serpent which beguiled. It will be held to his account. Likewise, we do nothing to deserve the free gift of salvation. Right? We didn't do anything on either side of it until we actually commit our own transgressions. We cannot earn it before or after saying yes to the gift, working for it or working to maintain it. But we do have to say yes by faith, by belief, to receive the restoration. That's all we can do to receive life. Faith. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Boom. Okay. So we're starting to see the model of reconciliation here. All of humanity is condemned by, condemned by one, Adam. All of our offenses are paid in full by Christ unto justification. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. That comes soon. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The first Adam is death. The last Adam is life. There it is. It's 1 Corinthians 15.45. I did have that noted. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last... Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay, This is the model of reconciliation, the word that was translated as atonement earlier. Shall reign in life is not now in our corruptible flesh, but during the millennium unto the new world. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. These are all synonyms. Shall reign in Jesus. Shall reign in life by one. Shall reign in Jesus by one. 
We only reign because we are in him. John 13 through 17. I am in my father and my father is in me. Now you are in me and I am in you. Right? We only inherit because we are in him. He is the one who reigns and the one who inherits. And that's how we receive our inheritance because we're in him. And it's the model reconciliation. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So this is where the model of reconciliation, I say it's like an equation. You have Adam's sin here, and it expands to all of mankind's sin. Then you have the cross in the middle, which justifies all. All are forgiven. Not just those who believe. All are forgiven. It's up to us whether we receive that forgiveness by faith. And then it goes back down to all are restored. So we have this kind of envelope that expands. And in the middle is the cross. Adam to all sin. The cross in the middle. All are justified. Come to God. And all is restored. When God becomes all in all. At the restoration of all things. It's like a big bang. Universe expands. Universe contracts. Goes back to that singular point. From one Adam expanded to all. Then the cross expanded to all. And back to one Jesus Christ. That is the model of reconciliation. Oh, I lost my Bible. Hold on. Romans 5. Give me a second. Okay, I think I got it fixed. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It is Jesus' obedience that makes us righteous. This becomes important when we are told to be obedient to the truth. It is Jesus' obedience. The old and new command of 1 John, which will be a study in the future, is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus' obedience that we observe to be obedient to. We recognize Jesus was obedient and we agree with that. In that way, we are obedient to that. Not our obedience to law or trying to be righteous, to works as lordship salvation proclaims. Pick up your cross and follow me stuff. Over the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's a good one. Verse 16, the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Why are people making the offense abound even more than it was designed to do in the law by focusing on their sin, violating the law rather than on Christ and his finished work? The law has fulfilled its purpose if one has accepted Jesus Christ. We die to the law. Comes up in two chapters. The remedy has been provided. Jesus Christ. The cross. His resurrection is the power. Why continue to wallow in condemnation of sin as a believer when grace has abounded more than what sin ever could? Verse 11, quote, And not only so, but we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the reconciliation, unquote. As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin only has reign of death. Grace abounds more as righteousness to eternal life. Eternal life is greater than death. Therefore, grace abounds more, right, than sin. Death is the end for this life, this flesh and all that, but eternal life is forever. The believer is not subject to the former and only has hope and promise of the latter. Is not subject to the former, death, and only has hope and promise to the latter, eternal life. So that is chapter 5 of Romans, and I hope that gave you peace, perfect peace. Shalom, shalom.